All right, what is going on, everybody? Thank you for watching, tuning back into the Metal Blade Live series. I'm your host, Riley McShane of Allegiant, and I am here today with uh, my buddy Dave Otero of Flatline Audio. Um, Dave, how you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good, bud. How are you uh, doing, bud? Hell yeah, bud. I'm doing great, bud. <laughs> oh, fuck <laughs> yeah, bud. <laughs> So, uh, right thank off you. The rails. Yeah, right. Just fucking just yeah. crash this train right into the ocean. Uh, so, we, <laughs> so, uh, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. It's cool to have you on here now that we've had, you know, obviously myself as the host, Travis as, you know, a guest, fucking man behind the music right here. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, Dave is the owner and master engineer of Flatline Audio. Uh, in a little town called Westminster, outside of Denver, in Denver, it's it's uh, Denver, whatever. It's, it's in pretty Denver. much Denver. Yeah, uh, and uh, we uh, we being a legion have recorded almost all of our albums with him. Uh, Sands one, uh, Cattle has done their past three albums with him. Cephalic Carnage does all their stuff with him. Chemist has done, I think, everything with you as well. Um, so yeah, that's who this guy is. He's a fucking monster of audio engineering and has released some of your favorite albums. Uh, so, are you are you staying busy this year? I guess that's the question that everybody kind of has uh, going into this kind of podcast, this kind of interview. Like with everything, you know, doesn't need to really be said. Uh, are you staying busy? Busier? the normal less busy you know how is how is denver feeling overall as far as bands and, and music and all that kind of stuff uh i'm i'm definitely staying personally busy uh there was of course there's like a, a period the first few weeks where everything was like more up in the air i did have some sessions cancel i had guys that were planning on traveling in that you know a lot of things got shuffled around uh, but I actually have managed to stay pretty busy. Part of that is just because, um, you know, now bands can't tour. So there's so what what can they do to stay active? It's record, write, record. Um, two, I was lucky enough to uh, be invited to to kind of do some content for the URM uh, group. Like so we did the a Legion Nail the Mix and um, I did. Uh, some other kind of teaching content for them that actually was really helpful to like bridge the gap initially because I did have like a whole you know project that was scheduled to be a month long get postponed like a week and a half before it was supposed to start Oof. so I was able to kind of fill a lot of that time there um, but yeah it's kind of weird it's one of the one of the more unfair things about the current situation is how um, unequally it affects s s uh, single industries you know so like we're all in the music industry and I have, I'm kind of in this middle ground. I'm, I'm sort of like the middleman between the business logistics side and the artist side. That's literally like kind of what a producer is supposed to do. So I have friends on both sides of that equator and everyone on the production side. So labels are doing pretty well. Um, anyone who like manufactures technology or plugins or equipment is doing crazy good right now because people oh, yeah. are stuck at home with with extra time and on the flip side of that all the people on the on the musical creative side are hurting obviously yeah. because like the bread and butter there is touring so it's kind of a bummer like on on one side i'm happy that i can stay busy but it uh yeah i feel definitely for the people on the music side like and i've been pushing uh, others in the industry to kind of contribute to to a lot of those, um, a lot of those causes that, that are trying to help equalize that balance, you know, like save our stages, I think is one of them, right. uh, um, uh, you know, that's, that's helping people to work in the entertainment industry and it, it, everywhere from venues to stage hands, to touring sound guys, uh, same kind of thing, you know, buy some merch like directly from your favorite bands right now, that kind of stuff uh, is pretty important. But as far as me personally, I'm staying busy. Um, part, like I said, you know, because what else the bands have to do and two because i've panicked when everything like exploded and i was like book book sessions <laughs> sessions record so i was like massively overbooked myself and i'm kind of paying that price right now um yeah. but i i should not complain because yeah. i'd rather be in this position than the opposite yeah absolutely i mean it's 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 funny what you said about how it's like you know you have people who are creating you know tech tech commodities and all this kind of stuff that are just mm -hmm. like flourishing right now but then you have yeah 
uh, you know, artists and, and musicians particularly who are like, you know, eating a bunch of shit because it's just mm-hmm. like our whole bread and butter is touring, which speaks volumes yeah. to like the state of the music industry in that it's like music isn't a commodity. Like the, the only thing that keeps bands going is the experience that they provide yeah. on the back of the music. And um, the thing is like that, that may come around to bite the, the industry side in the ass later, you know, yeah. like there, there's going to be a price to be paid for everyone here. Yeah. And that's kind of why I'm like trying to push, like, I mean, I get it on one side, like with so much uncertainty, people are, are kind of like, well, I'm going to take this good fortune that has been bestowed upon me by this uh, great virus uh, and keep it. But uh, yeah, man, I, I wish there was a way where we could equalize the pain a little bit more for everyone um, and kind of spread some of that around, like not to get real socialist on your, on your <laughs> ass right now, but it's like, we're all part of the same industry. And if, if, if venues shut down and bands break up because they have to like get, you know, normie jobs, um, then that that's all going to come back to hurt all of us in the end. So I wish, I wish there were more incentive or more, uh, more people out there trying to spread the wealth. Like I know Hosa, um, the cable company Hosa did a really cool thing where they, with that save our stages where they were matching donations. Oh yeah. And like, after like months and months, there was like, $400 $400 raised or yeah. something like I was like come on like yeah it's it's like I said it's a uh, it's it's hard to you know co- commodify commoditize something yeah. that has now been you know like I said it's just it's turned to the experience and if it's not mm. rooted in that experience then like the customer incentive is just not there yeah uh, and it's funny how it doesn't translate because it's like save our stages literally has the word stages in it. It's like completely rooted in the experience. Yeah. But it's, it's, there's, there's a disconnect there that, yeah, I, I am right there with you. I wish it would be a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more well connected. It's um, been a little too long too, not to dwell on the subject for, for no, too dude, long, but, go ahead. but like, you know, if like, um, if a band is on tour and their shit gets stolen or their van breaks down, there's always like a rush of support for in that immediacy, you know, but like, what are we six months into this situation now? So I feel like people that could maybe be helping out are kind of like, well, I'm just kind of settling into the day to day, but, uh, but it's like needed more than ever, you know? Yeah. I feel like in that situation, it's like the situation we're in now is so much more overwhelming because Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, a band gets their shit stolen or gets their van broken into, or, you know, whatever it might be you know, gets in a crash, people will rush to support because it's like, it's just that one band. And it's like yeah. this one thing yeah. that's just yeah. like a, an, 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 it's just the, the sing, singular instance that's happening. Whereas yeah. now it's like literally every band's virtual van has been fucking broken into. Like we're all, <laughs> we're all sitting here being like, Hey, our, all yeah. of our gear got stolen and set on fire. We found it, yeah. but it's ashes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but just pick your favorite. If everyone picked their favorite band, you know yeah that's and, true and buy some of their buy a shirt or two or do something to support them or pay for a live stream that they're doing you know just like yeah. just just do a little bit and I, I feel like a lot of people are but uh, yeah absolutely. i wish there could be something else happening you know i know a, a, a legion has seen a lot of direct support in that regard you awesome. know when this first started we started you know flipping our leftover merch uh you know just like directly and uh, people were were stoked. You know what I mean? People yeah. were definitely there to pick up the slack. So I think a lot of bands are getting that support. They just have to put themselves out there. And that's something that I feel like bands don't know how to do. They're just mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know how to ask for shit. Like, I, you know, because it, you know, yeah. it, it feels slimy, you know what I mean, in a certain regard yeah. that a lot of yeah. people don't want to be, oh, it damages our brand, trying to be like, hey, we need support, hey, we need this thing. Like, it's, you know. The... Well, you know, I mean, you just got to, you know, offer a service. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like you're not necessarily asking for money for free. It's just like b- buy a shirt. Hey, yeah. make a do a fundraising shirt, do a live stream, do, you know, like and it really um, I know it's not in every band's like personality to like pivot and and fully take advantage of the situations that are available. But whatever you can do, man, to yeah. stay active and stay in front of people's faces, um, it, you know, every situation uh opens doors and opens opportunities and it's up to you if you want to like you know be proactive in trying to t- t- get any benefit you can out of this current situation um 
versus just like you know take six months off kick your feet up play video games yeah exactly exactly well moving on to more dave centric stuff even though i could literally go on with that conversation for this entire fucking <laughs> podcast uh so um how did you get into recording in the first place um was it recording your own bands your friends bands did you like suck at the beginning was there a steep learning curve uh I, you know i i've tried my hand at like at home studio stuff and learning about shit like that and it's a fucking nightmare there's so much there's so much information and like so much ear training you have to do uh you know are there but that being aside um you know did you did you suck at the beginning and were there any early records that you know helped you really dial in your sound or really put you on the map as like oh this is this guy for this kind of production and all that kind of stuff um a few different parts of that question too or for, for one i started do, you know do, i was in bands i've been a musician forever um so i wanted to record my own stuff i had this old four track that my my brother six years older than me and we have both been musicians like uh he was in the past and I guess I sort of still am now. I don't know. He conned me into like, like blowing all my allowance money on this four track with him when I was like a kid. <laughs> and then I like, I didn't see it for like five years. Cause he was just like, this is mine now. Yeah. Sucker. <laughs> um, uh, but then it, and then he kind of like went on to, you know, other, uh, other interests. So that kind of fell down to me. I had that and I had a few like real crappy mics. I'm talking to like high school age now, you know, like 16, 17, no mic stands. He used to like tape, the mic cord to the ceiling and like hang it down like over the drum set you know and then into a input on the four track and i would do that just to kind of get some practice record um demos or record practices just because i thought it was fun and then i literally i was i think i was probably 17 like almost out of high school at that point where you're like well, what the hell am i gonna do for the rest of my life you know like now <laughs> i have to kind of sort of like fend for myself out there and i remember the exact moment like over this crappy four track with tape all over it and i was like i should do this for a job and then it was literally as simple as that then i just like kind of set my goals on that um and i'm i guess i'm lucky enough that i i managed to have some natural talent for it um i always felt like i was a, a fairly naturally talented musician as far as i could understand music i had a good enough ear um i had a had a good natural feel for it which is pretty important i do think there's part of music that you can't learn it just kind of has to be like absolutely in your brain from mm -hmm. birth uh and then and then i just got better and better i definitely didn't start off like there are some dudes now who it's like the first time they show up on the scene you're like jesus christ this is incredible sounding yeah it was not like that for me yeah. um <laughs> I started in a different era too, like computer recording DAW stuff was in its infancy. So I was still recording onto like ADAP machines. Uh, and uh, I had some money set aside that was to be used for college if I decided to go that route. And I took most of it and just bought gear. <laughs> Cause then like at that time, like we're talking 20 years ago because I'm a goddamn dinosaur. Uh, at that time, like there was a pretty steep entry price to any kind of recording right. it's not like you could go get a 250 fifty dollar interface and use the computer you already own and one or two mics and get started like you had to you had to have like digital recorders at that time um so it, it was more expensive to get started but i i did that to kind of as like a okay i'm gonna see if i can like uh prove this concept you know uh that that this would be a sustainable thing for me in the future and then i kind of just dove in did some as much internet reading as I possibly could back in the day. That was all like forums and stuff like that. There were no schools like URM or YouTube didn't even exist yet. So gaining knowledge was like more um, nerdy internet searching full of like yeah. the actually guys, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I just did it for a long time and I definitely, the early ones are not pretty, uh, but <laughs> I've been, I just stay stuck with it, I guess, you know? So. Yeah. Totally. Um, so, I mean, that being said, you answered a lot of stuff, covered a lot of information that kind of goes into th this next question. So what is your overall like recording philosophy being a guy who started closer to like the analog world, you know what I mean? And then moved, you know, like you said, from like the infancy of DAW's digital audio workstations for those of you who are watching, who aren't savvy with the terms, um, you know, 
starting at that stage and then moving to where you are now and the way things are now with with recording in general what is like your philosophy uh and do you change your approach for every project um yeah yeah it, it definitely is a slightly different approach um first off i just have to say that travis is trying to call me right now if there's one person that should understand i'm busy at yeah. the moment <laughs> it should probably be travis so travis i hope you're watching this bro also on. hit me up next me week like, let's go get burritos <laughs> jesus give come me on, man. give me 30 minutes yeah um <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, I def it 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 changes uh, in some ways. Um, obviously, I I have my technical workflow, and I have like the workflow that's kind of built into my studio. A lot of that stuff stays similar, but my approach as a producer, which is which is really a different sort of thing from the engineer, changes like wildly. Yeah. In fact, it's kind of it's interesting because I I have a lot of like repeat bands. Um, repeat customers it feels weird to call you uh, customers thank you for being a that's uh, us repeat we're a repeat customer, customer. riley <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh they worked with me you know for years and years multiple projects and i i think in their brain they know exactly how like every dave otero session goes but it's totally different yeah. um maybe within styles like if i recorded another band very similar to a legion it would probably be a pretty similar experience but other styles um in which everything i do is like rock or metal but that's a that's still like a a really wide breadth of music oh, yeah. um oh, yeah. you know that if you're into this scene you know there's there's it's about as deep and wide of a genre as as exists yeah. and uh and it changes a lot as far as like the the tempo at which we're recording and, and not, not like musical tempo but like the speed is which we're progressing through things uh, my attention to detail like um, if I'm recording a uh, kind of sludgy doom band and I hear like one slightly misfretted note or I think that like uh, they fret it too hard on like uh, the third chord of a riff, I'm not going to be like, excuse me, uh, and then like make them redo it. But with a legion, I probably would. Yeah. I'd be like, uh, excuse me, Greg. Um, <laughs> that note's not perfect. Too hard. That <laughs> note was sharp, Greg. <laughs> So, yeah totally. Uh, so and, it's different in that regard and then like the the feel I'll do more stuff live and more stuff at the same time my approach to like any editing i'm going to do is totally different um so things definitely change and but some of the technical stuff stays the same just because that's like my workflow it's how the studio is set up and the longer i've done this the the more i've kind of like found my comfort groove right and i know uh where i can streamline parts of the process um and still end up with a um a mix that suits the bands like i know i know what parts i can streamline without like making all of my production sound cookie cutter because that's something i definitely never want to do mm -hmm. i like i was saying i get to work with a pretty wide range of bands and metal probably more than most producers and i i really like that i think i'd go nuts if i only if i had to stick to just like one really defined style uh, so I do my best to not just like take the Dave Otero sound and just like slather it all over an album. Right. Um, and, and try and let like that band and their scene and then coupled with kind of like what I think I could do that could maybe help them stand apart and just like put that all together in one. You know? Right. Well, and I think that's been accomplished. It's like, you don't, I don't think the average listener would ever listen to, you know, a Legion's newest record and then Cattle's newest record and then chemist's newest record yeah. and be like oh that was all engineered by the same guy like there's, there's hopefully no they just way. like yeah, hopefully <laughs> they just think i just hope they all sound sick like yeah, i just yeah, want them to be like yeah, oh damn same, this is like, killer like a uh, archfire as well same thing yeah. it's like and I, I don't think that there are any production similarities between the newest Allegiant record and the newest archfire record and like not really you know what i mean like so it's yeah. it's it's uh you know it's definitely mission accomplished on that front it's like your cool. your your sound has be just become quality it's not like oh you know this uh you know this this one thing yeah. um and that and that's i was honestly i realized this and that's that was like sort of intentional um but i don't think i could have done it any other way yeah also yeah but I realize that it's probably a slightly harder path because there are there are a handful of dudes and I'm not going to name names and it's not even a bad thing. It's actually a good thing to have a really well-defined sound. Um, and that 
me and you can kind of like climb the ladder because you're just on one ladder, you know, so you can maybe get up that ladder a little faster. Right. Um, where I, where I'll like take a few, like climb up a few rungs and then like hop over laterally to like, you know, this other genre right. and then like, go, you know, so it's maybe taken me a, a bit longer than some to kind of make a name for myself. And I think I'm finally getting to that point where that's maybe a reality at this point. Right. But, uh, but, whatever i i'm i'm i wouldn't change it because i really like have being able to do that diverse style you know? absolutely absolutely so uh one point that was just brought up uh by someone is that your vocal production is particularly unique um you know you've you've worked with vocalists like travis ryan who is like mm -hmm. very much a pioneering vocalist in the metal community a dude like oliver from arc spire who is just like incredibly unique super super fast kind of stuff um, is your, is your take to vocal production kind of the same as it is with like bands in general, where it's just like, you know, each vocalist is different. You have to kind of cater to them and what they're going to do equipment wise and all that kind of stuff. Or is there kind of like an idea where you're like, okay, this is how vocals should sound and how they should be processed and how they should be produced. Uh, it's similar, like on the technical side, I stick to like kind of the basics, you know, as far as the gear I'm using and stuff like that. But as far as the approach on the producer side, it definitely changes. Um, and particularly with all those vocalists you mentioned and like, and you can add yourself to that mix as another premier vocalist of the genre that has uh, unique attributes, <laughs> <laughs> has unique attributes um, like you with your like amazing uh, clean abilities is something that's uh not as common for, for death metal dudes you know right. so that's a whole new element to your stuff uh i always i do feel like i'm pretty opinionated with vocals i don't like especially like patterns and diction and um like the small nuances uh, first off vocals are important more important than most metal musicians give them credit for yeah. it's still the most important part of an album it's the one thing that every single person who has a throat can relate to yeah you know so it's like it's the first thing people hear it's the first thing that can either bring them in or turn them off to a band um it's rare that you're gonna like a band and hate the vocalist like that almost never happens it's kind of it's something that like has to be there and good and it's just the first thing that hits people so even in death metal you have to put a lot of attention towards it and treat it as a very serious important part not just like an afterthought of some dude grunting over sick riffs right you know, which is i feel like what every guitar player thinks yeah definitely um, uh it's it's definitely the vocalist treatment in metal <laughs> for sure yeah i mean obviously in a legion it's it's different um you know for me personally as part of someone who like really takes a hand in the creative process and like you know we all work together and all that kind of stuff but i have definitely been in metal bands uh where my role was boiled down to like okay here i wrote these lyrics i wrote these patterns i literally just need your voice where the yeah. studio sessions were like all right so this next part is like but da, 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 da. and then i go up to the mic and i'm like all right cool oh, da, 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 da. And I'm like that's, <laughs> that's how we recorded the whole album so it's yeah. you know and guitar player wrote all that kind of stuff so yeah. it's uh it's definitely happened you know what i mean and i i can definitely relate with that idea but you're right uh and it's it's a genre-wide thing um mm -hmm. you know or i shouldn't say genre-wide but it's, it's a, a it's a music it's a music-wide thing, thing. You know? yeah it goes yeah. between genres where it's just like if yeah. you are a band that has a vocalist if you're not based in instrumental yeah. music it's it's the first thing people are going to relate to because everyone can sing or make noises with their face like you know and it um, makes sense like on the pop side everyone knows that you yeah. know like and yeah. they're all like like Beyonce, she, it's just she's a singer. Like who cares who else is in the band, you know? Right. And metal, it's not necessarily like that, but the vocals are still important and, and like probably the most important. And uh, a lot of like guitar players don't like to hear that stuff, but yeah. the ones that get it uh, will end up with albums that do better, you know? Because yeah. you do have to put a lot into it. And I don't know if it was like my my first instrument was a drummer, so I'm pretty rhythmically minded and focused. And that translates pretty well to vocals, yeah. Especially, especially in death in metal, vocals. because the pattern is is the hook. Yeah, you know, the like, vocals are much more of a percussive addition to the, yeah. the music in death metal because so, the melody is. I mean, there's it's not melodic. It's not a melodic yeah. style of singing. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. I completely completely agree. And you, it's funny that you say that because you know even before I was in a legion, Greg 
wrote a lot of lyrics, not all of them, but he wrote a lot yeah. of lyrics and a lot of patterns. And he's always kind of had a hand in that up until very recently mm-hmm. where he was just like, I trust you to do your thing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's true. You know what I mean? Like having other members of the band that understand how vocals work and being able to accommodate, you know, have every moving part work with each other instead of just like slapping something on top. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's deviate into another question so i don't sure. you know I'm, I'm, I'm like about to look at the camera and be like hear that guys fucking so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <tell him> Riley. <laughs> so greg talking to you buddy <laughs> yeah talk, talking to you greg no, uh so i have a question here that i think is really interesting because i don't necessarily even know what this means uh and this mm-hmm. was was presented by you know uh uh, for those of you who know him, uh, Bart over at Metal Blade, who used to be in Black Dolly Murder, um, do you master in your mixes? Why or why not? What does that mean? Does that mean like mastering? Explain that to me. Uh, that's a term I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, okay, well, so there's there's the production side is split up into a few different elements. There's obviously the recording and the production, the mix and the master. Right. And more commonly these days, the mix and the master are sort of being combined into one area or like more of one situation. So part, there's, and mastering itself is kind of like two phases. I probably, people are already like checked out, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a part of mastering that is the, the, I'll call it the sonic part. That's making the, the mixes loud and doing overall spectral adjustments. So a mastering guy uh, only has the stereo mix output from the mix engineer if they're two separate people. So it's not like they can't go in and turn the snare up or turn the vocals down. They have the completed mix. Right. And the mastering uh, guy's job is to bring it to commercial levels, meaning get it loud enough where it's, it's like fits in with all the other uh, uh, releases in the genre and then make some overall adjustments to make it sound good on a variety of sources. So you want like a balanced mix and we're talking about like EQ uh, frequency spectrum wise. So it's going to sound good on a phone and sound good if it goes on internet radio and sound good, you know, through crappy earbuds or on your hi-fi system. So it's just overall, it's like the final little icing on the cake. Right. Um, and, traditionally those have been two separate processes mix engineer finishes the mix they ship it out mastering guy gets it whole new spin you know on it and then there's maybe some collaboration back and forth a lot of people like starting with my i guess uh era of uh engineers producers started kind of doing it all at the same time one because the equipment became available the plugins were better at that kind of stuff um two because there's certain benefits um there are definitely some uh some downsides doing at the same time also, but there are some benefits of dialing in it all together and you can just kind of hear how everything goes through from beginning to end. And that way you can make adjustments on the mix side that maybe are affecting the master side over here um, where normally those, those two situations are so separated that that's not really as possible. Uh, So to get to the, to the root of the question, yeah, I do have a pretty full mastering chain in my mix um it takes a pretty beastly computer if you're using lots of like uh cpu driven plugins to do that kind of stuff uh, Mm -hmm. because typically the the mastering plugins are are very cpu intensive like they just like you they just steal a chunk you know they all have like high amounts of oversampling and some other technical jargon i don't need to get into but uh, so you got to have a BC computer. I spent like insane amounts of money over the years, just like constantly upgrading to be able to to do that. Um, but yeah, I do. I do do most of the sonic mastering in the mix. Um, part of mastering is also like song sequencing and making like Red Book uh, CD masters. And that's sort of the technical side, more more on like the delivery and production aspect of mastering. Right. So obviously that's done separate. But as far as the sonic qualities of mastering uh, i'll run that all in a mix session um and it, that's not too uncommon there's some big name you know andy sneep did that with like 90 percent of his mixes he's right. one of the first like legit dudes that kind of like legitimized that process um and i over the years i've only had one or two albums mastered by an outside mastering guy and in my opinion 
day didn't sound any better. One one time in particular, I gave the band a mastered version and an unmastered version. I told them, I was like, hey, it's part right. of my workflow. I know you want an unmastered one because they were going to go to this like big name mastering dude. And I gave him the mastered one and the unmastered one. And then they took the unmastered one and paid a ton of money. And then later he was like, yeah, we could have just used yours. It sounded about the same. Yeah. <laughs> so like, and that's yeah. not always the case, but um, I actually, and I also think I'm pretty good at mastering uh, by itself. Also, I do a healthy amount of that, just mastering projects. Right. Um, and I've always gotten um, pretty good feedback and I actually beaten out a few dudes, um, you know, like got like bigger mastering dudes and I'll be in like a little mastering competition with and then the band will pick me. So I, I think it maybe works okay for me in particular because I, I'm, I'm maybe just pretty decent at mastering. So yeah. It, yeah. it's maybe not the best idea for some people, but it works for me. Hell yeah. Um, so we've kept you here for about 40 minutes, so I don't want to keep you too long, but I do have a couple more questions. Um, sure. So as an engineer uh, and as someone who has been not only on the – you know, back end side of things, but like you mentioned, you're a musician. I've seen videos of you playing drums that I'm just like, what the fuck, Dave? Like, it's don't share those. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. They're really good. Uh, they're really fast, anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> but as someone who's you know kind of on both sides, someone who's experienced you know both sides of the spectrum, do you have any advice for bands who haven't recorded like a like a real record yet, or you know things to expect um, or to practice before they actually hit the studio? Um, I would, I would say this one, put a lot of, put a lot of time into who you select. If you're, if you're going to pick a producer, um, that's really important because the different guys will give you very different results. You know, a producer is, is sculpting the entire project. I mean, and like really everything that gets recorded kind of goes through their lens and even the process, uh, that, that they prefer to use can have a drastic difference on, you know, the final result. So it's really important. Don't just like um, the, the worst thing you should ever do, which I don't think is too common anymore, but the worst thing you should do as a metal band is like call your local recording studio and just like get the house guy who, you know, listens to string cheese incident and has never <laughs> heard like, a, it was like the last metal album you heard was like, you know, ride the lightning or something. So right. that's, that's never going to pan out well. Um, so make a good choice there. It's, it's, it's as important as picking a band member really. Um, and then the one thing that I could could say to musicians is when you're practicing, pay attention to what your performance sounds like and not just that you're hitting the notes. Does that make sense? Like, so let's use a guitar player, for example, like, okay, practice your part in typical metal fashion. You're playing something that's 20% harder than you're capable of. So yeah. you're, you're like right at the edge of your abilities and okay. You get through it. Okay, cool. You hit the, all the notes, all the fingers landed in the right spot and your pick hit all the strings. Like, okay, that's good. But then record that and then listen to it back. And if it sounds like a scratchy mess, that's like a completely unusable, then you have more work to do. You know, it's like, right. it's not just a matter of performing the part or accomplishing the section. It's like, it has to sound good too. And I, and I feel like some musicians, particularly in metal, just get too focused on the technicality of it. And it's all they, all they want to do is like, make sure they get all those notes and they write this sick riff and like, cool, I played it. But then like, listen to that and then listen to a similar riff from one of your favorite albums. And like, if they don't sound in the same ballpark right then reevaluate and Absolutely. so it's like it's just be honest with like what the actual output of your entire performance is coming across as rather than like hey i'm hitting the frets right you know like you have to be able to like own the part and play it and that's like perfect intonation and not picking too hard and pick angle and dialing in your gear making sure you have the right string gauge on like it there's a lot uh of that stuff that goes into a good performance and a good sound and your producer can help out with a ton of that. But if you already have like the leg up and you've thought about that and you understand like, okay, it's what comes out of this whole package that matters. Not just that I'm playing the notes or singing the line or hitting the drums. You got to do it. You got to do it well. And yeah. the only thing that matters is what it sounds like. So focus yeah. on that. Absolutely. I, uh, to add to that, uh, point as someone who has worked with you and also, you know, many other engineers in, in my time, 
be prepared. You know what I mean? Like be as prepared as possible. Send yeah. your engineer your demos, you know, make demos, you know, yeah. for the sole purpose of sending to your engineer so that they know what they're getting into and they already, you know, they're not going in blind because that's just going to make the whole process last longer. Things are going to get overlooked because they're focusing on learning the material as they're recording you um, rather than being like, oh, I already know this. Like, th this is what I think you need to do. Let's work on this part and that part and like having purpose and intent when they go into the recording session. Um, yeah. You know, a little and, tidbit. Riley, Riley saved the day for the roundabout cover. <laughs> like, holy crap. Like, a little backstory. Everyone knows Legion did the yes cover. Yeah. Um, when Greg pitched that idea to me, he didn't tell me it was a yes cover. Yeah. He didn't tell me it was an eight and a half minute song. That's essentially like eight songs in one song. So I budgeted time for like, oh, cool, death metal song. Oh, sick. And then uh, I found out like two or three weeks before that that's the song we were doing. Maybe he did tell me and I was like, Whoosh. I don't yeah, know. No. But either way, I, it became apparent to me very shortly before our time that we really didn't have enough time for that. And I reached out to everyone, Riley included, and I was like, please come prepared. Please know your stuff because it's a, such a complex song and a monumental undertaking. We don't have time to be learning this in the studio. Yeah. And uh, you like demoed out your entire vocal performance and you figured out all of the original harmonies yeah and at first when you told me that i was like oh cool that's gonna save us time and then i got into that song and realized how insane some of those vocal harmonies were oh yeah and it would have been so difficult to do that in the studio and because you had already done it i meant we could start from there and then spend any additional time like meaning like the spare 20 minutes we had um yeah. like at adding to it you know yeah. like hey what if we try this or what if we try this or let's take this one weird thing and change it you know rather than just trying to get back to that baseline so specifically in instances like that you know when you have a major undertaking and as most bands are like under budgeted and and don't quite have enough time as they should have in the studio to get things done properly right uh the more prepared you can be um, just means that you can spend more time improving upon that and like thinking outside the box with your producer and really utilizing their talents um, to, to make your entire project better th rather than just getting to the baseline of playing the parts, you know? So. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, be prepared. Make, make a, send your engineer as much as you can, especially in metal where it's like every album is a monumental undertaking, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you, you go note for note with a metal record versus like a pop record and it's there's just so much more i mean it's uh, yeah. you and i have discussed the the differences in in production nuances between pop and metal and we mm -hmm. can have that conversation another time but <laughs> it's uh it's definitely you know two different animals for sure apples and oranges yeah. but like i said note for note it's generally a much more monumental undertaking to make a metal record than something that's a little bit less like involved so definitely be prepared yeah you know, send your engineer everything. Um, so I have one more question for you. That's kind of a, sure. kind of sort of like a two-parter, uh, half from, uh, the questions I already have for you. And then one that's kind of from a fan. Um, mine is anything you've worked on lately that you, you know, have really enjoyed working on or want people to check out or anything like that. And then that kind of ties into a question from a dude named Josh Medlinger Hein. Uh, what was the hardest, most difficult album you have had to produce? So, two-parter there. Okay. Uh, the first one, I'll throw a few bands out there. Um, uh, a band that is pretty awesomely making a lot of waves with Metal, band, uh, Metal Blade these days, uh, Cult of Lilith. Yeah. Those dudes are crushing it. I'm seeing them working really hard, um, making a lot of their own content. And every time I see any comments or reviews, they're, all, they're always, like, ubiquitously positive. Um, cool band that I mixed last year and then sent over to you guys and, uh, you guys were stoked on it. So I'm, I'm happy that whole thing came into fruition. I'm, I'm glad they're doing well, super sick band, super unique sound, extremely talented guys. Uh, so definitely check that out. If you haven't, I'm, I'm really stoked. Metal Blade's been pushing it uh, pretty hard too. Yeah. Um, another cool band called Tetrarch. It's definitely not really in the extreme genre it's more in the like uh radio i mean you could call them new metal i think they call themselves new metal right um doing really well i finished up an album with them like way early this year 
uh, sounds massive. Like one of my one of the productions I'm most happy with, uh, especially in that side. Like in in uh, I don't want to say softer because it's like super heavy, but it's just not it's not tech death. It's yeah, just, more more commercial rock stuff. Yeah, more commercial yeah. sound, but it sounds awesome. And they're definitely like heavy for that side, which I like. Uh, they're doing really well right now. They just signed a deal with another uh, another label. So I won't mention because you guys will just like redact to that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> like censored. <laughs> Sorry, Metal Bay podcast. Um, uh, they're doing really well, so I'd say those two. Uh, as far as t- uh, most difficult production, it may be the recency bias taking effect here, but I am currently in the finishing stages of a mix for a band called Inferi. Oh, and, yeah. And I, the, they haven't really announced anything yet um, because they some things are unsure about the release. And they also have another album that's literally being released right now. Yeah. I've never recorded a band as they are releasing a different album. Yeah. <laughs> so they're trying to separate uh, that a little bit, but whatever. Uh, uh, maybe they'll get mad at me for spilling the beans. But that project was m- so intense. I it think so... Oh. So, sorry, sorry a lot of people that i know personally are going to shit a brick they are going to be so fucking excited to hear that you're working on new and fairy material so that it is pretty awesome insanely musically dense yeah uh, and it was just like mind melting like every day i would go i would leave the studio and just lit i felt like my brain had just like melted and was like floating like somewhere <laughs> in my lower jaw and all of this was just like a void yeah. <laughs> um it was like completely exhausting but it is really sick uh it ha- it's got like the highest like he just sent me malcolm if anyone knows malcolm just sent me some orchestral stems the other day which that is also a huge element to their music mm-hmm. and i think i have like over 600 tracks in the yeah. project yeah it is ridiculous yeah. <laughs> uh so that's that's uh, was has been a difficult also very rewarding super fun not difficult in like a personality kind of thing but just like holy crap this is so much work right. uh, kind of thing but um yeah there have been a lot of ones over the years that that i look back on with like rose colored glasses you know because i just uh, but uh, at the time I would just go home and just like want to crawl into a closet yeah. and, like, the doors and sh- shut the lights off. I needed like a sensory deprivation tank yeah. to, to uh, calm down after the onslaught yep. of notes. Uh, but... Well, one, one last thing before I let you sure. go, which I obviously couldn't do this podcast without mentioning uh, the back of your head. We've been seeing a lot of the, the front of your head here. It's a really yeah. funny. One of the very first questions when we first started was uh, this guy, Michael Hicks, uh, saying, Dave, how do you keep the front of your head as sexy as the back of your head? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, a, it's an undertaking. But uh, for those of you who don't know, the back of Dave Otero's head is a, a long running. It's like a four or five year old fucking gag now. Um, yeah. That was started by the Allegiant guys. Yeah. Um, because... <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Thanks, you're, buddy. You're, you're welcome. Because uh, in that room that Dave is sitting in, uh, directly behind him is a couch, and directly in front of him is his like computer setup and all that kind of stuff. So when you're working with Dave and you're watching him do his thing and he's recording another member of your band, you're sitting on this couch directly behind him. And so really you get a lot more face time. I guess with the non face side of his head. So we made <laughs> we made this uh this Facebook page called the Back of Dave Otero's Head and basically every band that has ever worked with him ever was like, "Oh my god, it's so true." <laughs> so now it's uh it's this long running gag about the the back of Dave Otero's head. So you're welcome for that uh Yeah. Yeah. At one point I have a screenshot on my phone somewhere where you can like type the name of a Facebook page or topic into Facebook yeah. and in the sh- search results i don't know if it still does at the time it would have in some very small text underneath the listing like this many people are talking about this topic (laughs) and i don't know how like this number is outrageous but it was like it was something like two hundred thousand people are talking about this topic (laughs) and like i can't i that must be some weird or like a a, this you know spider webbing reach calculation they do right there's no way two hundred thousand people were talking about that but I have that saved in my phone, and when I'm 80, I'll look back on it fondly and be like, 
Oh, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> you, you well, I, I know that uh, I know that people have seen you at places like Nam and stuff yeah. like that, and like s- taken secret pictures of the back of your Dude, head I, and then sent it to like us and been like, "Hey, look who I just found at Nam," and I just pretty, about piss my pants every time. It's so it's kind of it's kind of creepy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's, weird. It's, it's so the closest <laughs> I've come to any sort of real fame, you know, in the real world. Is like going home or like being at a show and then like looking at my phone in between sets and being like, oh, there's the back of my head taken yeah. like 10 minutes ago <laughs> by some unknown person. And you, you're you like, Jesus Christ. And I need like, immediately I need start to... looking over your shoulder like, who the fuck <laughs> yeah. is doing this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's slightly unsettling. Uh, but as a whole, it's uh it's flattering, so yeah. I have to take yeah. it as a flattering thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad you've adopted that perspective. Uh, <laughs> it's the only one. It's the only way to make this <laughs> not insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, thank you so much, man, for coming yeah. on the show. I really appreciate having you. It's always great seeing you uh, on a personal level and not just on a uh, you know answer my interview questions level. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you again on the new Legion record, probably next year sometime. So hell yeah, hell yeah. Well, thanks, dude. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, For those of you uh, who are still with us, you can follow Dave at any of these lovely social media links listed below us here. Uh, Keep up on the bands that he's recording and the work that he's doing. As he mentioned, he does stuff with, like, Nail the Mix, uh, you know, as well as teaching and things like that. So if you are in the business of learning the business of recording and recording engineering and producing and all that kind of stuff, this guy is definitely uh, an infinitely useful resource. Also hit up my personal YouTube channel, uh, yes. which I'm not I'm not like crazy active on um, because obviously the, the making albums is a real job. Uh, but I do cool stuff. And I did. If you're interested in the cattle album in particular, I did a bunch of videos focused on some of the behind the scenes studio side stuff um, while we were recording Death Atlas. So nice. that's uh, Dave Otero tube, I think, is the is the URL. Awesome. YouTube.com slash Dave Otero tube. Hell yeah. Well, thanks again, man. And uh, yep. until next time, take her easy. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This is the Metal Blade Live Series Podcast. I'm your host, Riley McShane. This is our guest, Dave Otero. And we will see y'all next time. <laughs>